listening to Mental Selling, the sales performance podcast, a show from Integrity Solutions. This is a podcast for passionate leaders in sales and customer service who are driven by purpose, not just a paycheck. People who want to create broader and deeper connections with customers and their teams by building trust and mastering the critical mental and emotional sides of sales. You're about to hear a conversation from sales leaders and industry experts about what it takes to translate sales knowledge into sales performance. How to change the sales conversation by putting the focus on building relationships and adding value, removing the blockers that keep salespeople from reaching their potential, creating an inspiring learning environment and coaching culture, and ultimately increasing sales achievement and improving customer loyalty. Ready to rise up to the top of your game? Let's get right into the show. Welcome to Mental Selling. Uh, I'm Will Milano with Integrity Solutions, and we're excited to be back with our first new episode in quite a while. We've got a new name, as you can see, a new look, uh, a new host. I, I describe it to people as they can think of me as the second Darren from Bewitched. If anyone's old enough to remember the show Bewitched, you'll remember that Samantha's husband, Darren, was seamlessly switched to a new actor mid-show, and that's sort of what we're doing here with Mental Selling. Uh, we're in process of relaunching the podcast for the new year for 2022, and hopefully you've listened to us before. We have a couple of dozen episodes that you can go back to previously. Hopefully you've already listened to some, but we wanted to spend a few minutes today just talking about um, what's to come in the new year, what you can expect and why. Um, we're designing mental selling or redesigning, if you will, for uh, sales leaders and sales pros who, who understand and, and maybe need more help understanding uh, the major role that mindset and their attitudes and beliefs and, and ultimately their, their motivation plays in their success. And understanding that how a salesperson or a sales leader looks at his or her role and what they do every day matters far more to their success than any sort of script or tactics or product knowledge that they're taught and training. So when the pandemic began over 18 months ago and everybody was isolated and, and forced, like it or not, to interact with customers and, and to sell virtually, and that was really just a, a sudden acceleration of a trend that was, that was already gaining steam. It did a number on salespeople mentally, and it forced a lot of them into some new and pretty uncomfortable truths and behaviors that they probably weren't ready for. So to kick off, I thought there would be no one better to bring in than one of our favorite previous podcast guests uh, who can speak to these things probably as well or better than anyone I know. And this is Mike Fisher. And if you've listened to our podcast before, you know Mike. He's been a guest on the podcast twice before. Actually, our most recent episode, uh, episode 23, is about tips for better preparing for sales calls and and asking better questions. Uh, and that one with Mike has been really popular. And, and Mike was also featured on episode 12, which if you go back, talks about how to become more intuitive about how your customers prefer to communicate and, and adapting to their style. So, and Mike is a longtime master facilitator and consultant for Integrity Solutions. And he's also chief sales officer for another Nashville, Tennessee based company called sales bullpen. So, uh, Mike, I know you're busy. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's great to have you as, as the uh, inaugural guest for the Mental Selling. Yeah, I, I'm honored. It's, it, I'm thrilled. I'm glad you called. I'm, I'm uh, you know, this is so near and dear to my heart, Will, and, and obviously we've known each other for a long time. So it's, uh, it's, it's, um, I'm glad to, to be a, get to be honored to be the, one of the early guests going into the next year. I was thinking about uh, our discussion and, and what came to mind for me was a Wall Street Journal article that I read back in, I think it was it was late summer, mm -hmm. and it was a really insightful article, but it was directly tied to what this discussion in this podcast is, is about. The article was titled, if you haven't read it, go search for it. Um, the article's titled, The Pay is High and the Jobs are Plentiful, but Few Want to Go Into Sales. And it was really interesting piece in that it, it, um, it talked about how salespeople can play such a big role in helping to solve problems for people and for companies and, and make good money doing it along the way. But yet as much as the role is needed today, probably more than ever, the number of sales job openings in the U S has never been higher and recruiters are really struggling to fill them. And when the article dug deeper into why that was, that was happening, 
it looked at you know the number of sales jobs advertised. This was the first half of the year was double what it was the previous six months. And many young workers, though, when looking at sales jobs, they're assuming that being a salesperson means convincing customers to buy with cliche high pressure tactics and sort of the the used car salesman view. And they're turned off by it, and, and so they they are resistant to it. And of course, it mentions that. Most people, if you're in college, just like you and I were, getting into sales isn't exactly something that you major in. And and people tend to, far more often than not, they get into sales by accident, right? Anyway, it's a great article, and I recommend that anyone listening here goes, goes and reads it. One person says, quote, the new template for a salesperson is not about cold calling. It's not mechanical. You have to be empathetic and deeply curious about clients' businesses. Mm-hmm. And, and one other thing the article mentions is that contrary to what people think, this is interesting. It said liberal arts majors, not, you know, say business majors, right. tend to make really good salespeople because of their writing, reading, and communication skills. But of course, most, I think, liberal arts majors or people that did, you know, major in that in school, again, are not thinking, wow, I really want to get into sales. Or they, again, have a really negative view of what sales really is. So with all that said, um, let's bring you in. I'd love to hear your perspective on that and just, what you're seeing with companies when it comes to how something seemingly so basic, like their view of selling and belief and, and what they're actually representing for their company really shapes what, what comes next for them and how well they're, they're ultimately going to do. Yeah. It, you know, it's funny. It, from the article, you said something that triggered a, a thought for me. And, and one of the things that, that you mentioned was just the, they have to be deeply curious about the person's business. And I think that really is a, is a, a precursor to being successful in selling, I think, because I think the customer can tell when you're, when you're genuinely interested in helping them grow and helping them solve problems. And when you have that, that curiosity from a selling perspective, uh, I think you have a healthier view of selling uh, when you look at what you're doing. And, And it's interesting because I don't think people necessarily, every group that I'm with, we talk about the, their view of selling, the congruence model, if you guys are familiar with that, but the view of selling, view of abilities, values, commitment to activities and belief in product. And it's interesting when you take those five dimensions and you ask them, you know, if I always ask the groups, if I stepped out and asked 10 people about salespeople, what would they tell me? 10 people in the streets. I'd say, what, do you, what would they tell me? And they always come back with slick, you know, pushy, all those things, mm-hmm. snake oil, whatever. Yeah. And, and I think that's true. But I don't think people necessarily have a bad view of salespeople. I think they immediately think of a bad experience they've had with a salesperson. Right. Because I can also, at the same breath, ask them, hey, I need to go get, uh, you know, my car fixed. Who do you recommend as a really good mechanic? Oh, I got my guy. You know, I got, he, she's great. He's great. Whatever their person is for whatever they need. And that's just usually a salesperson. That's somebody that, that treats them right. And they, they'll always, and they're loyal to that person. I'll go here and I'll go there. So it's kind of interesting that I think the initial piece is negative. I think when you dig down a little bit deeper and start asking questions, you'll find that they probably have somebody that they really trust. And, and that is a salesperson too. So I think the view, the lens that we look through what a salesperson, the, the initial definition I'll share an example, Will, too, on this is, is I do a lot with medical device companies. And oftentimes there are there's your salespeople, right? The reps. But then there's also the clinician side that work in, in hand in hand with the sales reps a lot of times. And when I'm with the clinical folks, it's amazing how many times when we talk about this model, they have a really poor view of selling coming in and they don't want to do it. They're asked to sell and they go, Ugh, I don't want to do that. That's, you know, all the negative. And yeah. then when we define it and say, well, if you think about selling, you guys are service, you're clinicians, you're service. So that's uncovering needs. It's filling your, your patient's needs and it's adding value. We define selling as uncovering needs, filling needs and adding value. It's the same thing. And when we start looking at it and they see them go through that process, it could be clinicians, it could be banking. Uh, it's, it's interesting when I think about when I work with a lot of bankers, I, I had a really great compliment after the course, not too long ago, I had a lady that said, I've been selling for 25 years. I just never called it that. And now I see it. Yeah. And that basically told me she had a new healthy view of what she does every day. And it's really fun to see their confidence go up. So I, I don't, I, I think to, to your point, it's a huge part of their success. And we can dig in a little bit here, but I, I think it's uh, it's a huge, if you don't have a healthy view of selling, your commitment to activities is going to drop way down because I don't want to go be pushy and you know, slick and all those things. And I don't, I don't want to call a new business. I'm just going to, I'm going to spend time with customers that like me and you don't yeah. do your business that way. Well, and it's also like in the, in the instance of, um, you know, we know a lot of banks and credit unions, you know, you walk into a bank or a credit union branch and we say, you know, nobody in there has the word sales in their job title or right. probably even in their job description. Yeah. 
but the reality is that everybody that works in that branch has a collective responsibility yeah. for selling. It's, it's, and, it's but it's that view of it that they've yeah. got to get past. They've got to break down those sort of internal mental barriers yeah. to really understand what selling means and how, how it's directly tied and intrinsically linked yeah. with customer service. Yeah. When, when people go home for the holidays, just watch what happens. This will be a good test. When you go from the holidays and people ask you what you do and, and you're in a sales role, uh, if you tell them you're a territory manager for a company, that should be a red flag. <laughs> what do you do? Well, I'm, I'm a territory manager. Or I, we, have, we give all these creative reason, names for what we do when it's really sales. You know, yeah. I saw one guy and I, I remember in my whole career, one guy, he, he handed me his card one day and next to his name, it said super salesperson. And I'm like, that's such a healthy view. <laughs> so you you yeah. just don't see that very often. Right. You don't. Can you talk a bit about, you know, we talk about, you know, these things that you've got to have a positive view of selling and, um, you know, all those things that you're describing where people need to be mentally, but what does it actually look like both when it does happen and when it is there as well as when it's not like, can you sort of share examples of somebody that has that positive mindset and then look at the other side of the equation like what happens with somebody that maybe does get into a, a sales role, they agree to it, whether whether they get into it kicking and screaming or not. Yeah. But if they're unable to get past those things, what happens? And ultimately, you know, why are they going to flame out? Here's a good, here's a good reframe for you. I'll, I'll give you an example. I do a lot with, uh, with, well, I just this week did a, a group that was newer salespeople. So I had a newer sales team. Now when they come in and they're newer, they come in for whatever reason that they join the company and they, they want to do this and they, they, for their job, but I don't think they really know what they're getting into, you know, a lot of times. And, and yeah. I'll, give, I'll give the medical advice example. They all come in because it's a glamorous thing. And the reality is they have no idea what they're going to get into. And a lot of it is grunt work. It is going and calling on people on a regular basis. It is, it is, it is, you're on call, you're on the things you have to do. And, and it's interesting because the mental side of that of what they what they need to do and go in and 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 are they prepared to go call on people most of the time they're not and 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 i, I think what it is 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 I, I sat next to a surgeon the other day on an airplane and i asked him when a rep calls on you what makes a difference in a great rep to you and a, and a rep that's not as as effective and he said they bring value i'm like mm -hmm. really what do you mean they bring value and he said they they know my patient demographic. They know my they know my business. In other words, they they they've seen my surgeries, my cases, and they say and they they bring really valuable things to say. I noticed something. Or I had a question about this. Why did you do that? That type of thing. And they're helping me grow my business. They they help me with my patient demographic. They help me be a better surgeon at what I do. I said, what about the ones that don't? I said they come in and they try. It's Groundhog Day. They come in and sell. They try to push the same product, the same thing that they do every day, and they're not prepared and they're just selling for them. And so oftentimes when I'm with a group, I'll share with them an example of how my personal experience, I had a, a, a situation where my daughter fell into a bonfire one time and we were, she was probably 12 years old and, and we're mm -hmm. jumping, these kids were uh, jumping over the hot coals or whatever. And she got burned really badly. Hands had to literally push out of the bonfire and her, her legs were burned severely. So I carried her into the burn unit and I can remember going in there and, and they, they went, we went through all the things and they basically, at the end of the day, we had to, to, to wrap and unwrap her legs for about eight weeks, uh, 12 weeks, I guess, with this, this, this product, Silver Smoke the Dean, and go through all these things. And so when I tell them, when I share that story with them, I'll say, you know, you have a get-to job, not a have-to job. And what I mean by that is some jobs don't really matter. There's, they don't have an impact like yours does. Yours, you get to go every day and call on somebody that makes a difference in someone's life when you go through what they do, and you get a chance to do that. And they reframe a little bit because I help them to see that I saw this not as a sales rep selling a product to a, to a person, but to, as a as a an end user, in this case, a parent and a patient that was looking at what you did and what a difference it made in that person's life. And now there's very little to no scarring on her legs. And I'm thankful that somebody called on a doctor that had a product that solved that problem. Is that I hope that makes sense when I say that. But, no, it's a great articulation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when they see that, all of a sudden I watch people's shoulders drop and their body language change and they go, I want to do that. I want to help somebody. And when they start to see that and what you do. So one of the things we have to do when we get into a sales role mentally and emotionally is step back and say, what difference does my job make? How can I articulate our value proposition? And when I go in, kind of begin with the end in mind from a salesperson's perspective, and I start thinking about why would they want to use what I'm going to suggest over what they're currently using now, then I have to think about what dif a differentiates my product, but b what's the what's the emotional why that they would use it? Does it save them time so that they can spend more time with their two year old? Does it yeah. save them money so that it helps the company? Does it impact the end user in a way that's positive? What is it that we do differently 
so that we can help them maybe different from our, their competition, but mm-hmm. differently. And when you come at it from that perspective, I think you're genuinely looking and asking questions that the, the person that's sitting across from you is going, thank you. Well, okay, let's talk about your business. In other words, they don't, I don't have to go in and tell, 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 but I can ask questions. And so tell me a little bit about your business. What are some things that you're struggling with? What are things you could improve in when change? When you start asking questions that, that get them talking about their business, I think you like what you do better because you're helping them. How do you feel? I I always ask the group, how do you feel when you solve a problem? I feel good. Right. So let's think about how can we, how can we help solve their problems? And I think you see yourself more than as a problem solver, not as this salesperson pushing product. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's, that's excellent. Thank you. At Integrity Solutions, we believe you need a different approach to sales and service to succeed in tomorrow's world. We know that sales performance isn't just about what you know, it's about who you are. We are performance experts who enable sales teams to build trusted customer relationships with integrity at their core. For over 50 years, Integrity Solutions has specialized in award-winning, innovative sales, service, and coaching training solutions that fuel performance, grow talent, lift up customers, and elevate leaders. Our solutions connect knowledge, skills, and values to help our clients embrace their roles with a greater sense of purpose and outperform year after year. No one is better at unleashing the mental side of selling. Learn more about our unique approach and the clients and industries we proudly serve at IntegritySolutions.com. So again, this episode is serving to be a bit of a preview for what's to come. And one of the areas that we're going to focus on is not only mental selling as it, as it pertains to the salesperson, yeah. but as it pertains to the sales leader. And I know you've worked a lot with groups where you, know, you have a high performing salesperson, mm-hmm. they've been promoted into a role, now they're leading a team and through no fault of theirs, they're entirely unprepared for it. It's an entirely sure. different job. I always use the analogy of, because my wife's a teacher, I yeah. said, you know, a lot of times schools make the mistakes of the mistake of promoting a really good teacher into being the principal. Right. And because they're a great teacher doesn't mean they're going to be a great administrator because it's two entirely different roles. Yes. And if you don't really embrace and have a passion for that new role, you're not going to do well. And I think we see the same thing for sure. right, with, with salespeople that become sales leaders. So that's another aspect that we're going to talk about ongoing in this podcast. And what I wanted to get from you is a, just a bit of perspective on like why the sales leader matters and what their mindset shift needs to be in, yeah. in serving their people. Well, you, you see the same thing in sales organizations everywhere. You're good at sales, so you get promoted into a, in a leadership role. And that does not always translate into, into leadership because I think what happens is a lot of, of sales leaders get into that role where they miss the dopamine shot of, of winning a sale. And so yeah. they want to go in and, and what you'll see is they bring the manager with them when they go close the deal. And that's the manager stepping in and saying, okay, let me, let me, it's really selfish because you're not teaching them how to close the deal. You're doing it yourself and you're really doing it selfishly because you like that dopamine feeling when you get that, we close the deal and I got to, yeah, we did it. And the yeah. reality is you'll do a lot better as a leader. If you'll step back and teach them how to, it's kind of like parenting. I hate to say it this way, but it's a lot like parenting. You don't, you don't prepare the the path for the kid. You prepare the, the kid for the path. And, yeah. and when you can help teach your people and, and help them by asking questions. And so leadership, the mental side of leadership, some of the, if you ask yourself, who is my best leaders I've ever had, they probably challenged you and they probably were brutally honest with you sometimes and they held you accountable to things. And what I found is a lot of leaders, we hold back from, from holding our team accountable because we don't want to hurt their feelings sometimes. If that's our, honestly, you can go back to, I can go deep into this, but your behavior yeah. style oftentimes dictates that. So we, we want to be their friend. And right. I think we get in the way sometimes, but if you look at accountability, let me give you a different lens. If you look at accountability, if they people don't mind accountability, if they actually hit the goal or did the action, because then they get to be the star of the show for a minute while you're giving yeah. praise and recognition. They like that. And yeah. so it's a matter of if they've done the job, if they don't do the task, then they don't like to have that that accountability. But somebody has to hold them accountable. And, and I think that there's a uh, leadership is the mental side of and, and I tell you where I'll go a different direction a little bit. This, but this is what I'm seeing a lot right now with leadership. I encourage leaders oftentimes to take time out for themselves and prepare. And what I mean by that is you almost have to set a meeting with yourself each week for an hour, maybe just to get out of the current and plan and really think about things as a leader. And when you can do that, I can look at the people on my team and say, okay, 
who were the who were the, the players on my team? Who am I meeting with this week? And what are we sitting down and going through? And really think about how am I going to communicate or what their numbers are and looking at things and how can we really help them with challenges and issues that they have? Oftentimes they know that answer to their own challenge. So coaching and 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 leadership parallel selling in a lot of ways because you listen more than you talk. And if you're not prepared, you tend to be very reactive, yeah. which is emotional versus responsive, which is logical. And if you've had time to think and prepare emotionally and mentally yourself, you are more prepared, which leads to you being more responsive to their needs, if that makes sense. I hope that I hope that makes sense as I say that. I know it was a way of saying it in my head. But I think when when leaders can do that and they can they can really take on the role of a leader and understand that my job is to help them grow and develop. And sometimes I get to praise and get some awesome recognition. Sometimes it means I challenge them and cause them to look in the mirror. Sometimes mm-hmm. it means I have a, a difficult situation and, and I have to have a conversation about that. And your situational awareness, some of the best leaders are, are aware situationally. Of, do I need to be a coach here? Do I need to be a leader here or do I need to be a manager here? And right. you look at those three scenarios and go, how do I best serve? And in each piece of person on your team is different based on tenure and who they are, you know? Right. And I know you've, you've always preached that quite a bit, that the sales leader has a role of leadership, management and coaching. Yeah. And they're all interconnected, but they're also very, three very distinct things. Yes. And I know you've, you've used the basket. I've heard you use the basketball analogy of, you know, when it's some, when a salesperson becomes a sales leader, they've got to realize that they're the coach on the sidelines, yeah. drawing up the plays mm-hmm. and you can't take the shot anymore. Right. And, and that is, again, a, a, that's a very mental paradigm shift that that's hard for sales yeah. leaders to do. And it's hard for them to do on their own unless they're, they're prepared. And what happens is, I think you hit a good point. What happens is oftentimes, uh, and it, this is unfortunate, but companies will promote someone into that role, but not give them the tools to be able to do those things because it, it's like, okay, great. You did. It's almost like I used, you used the teacher analogy. I use a football analogy. You just pulled the best running back off of the field and gave him a clipboard and said, coach the team, but then didn't give them the, the tools to be able to coach the team. Well, right. one, they're not prepared, so it usually is going to be negative uh, uh, re- response to the team itself. How that, how that they, how they prepare and how they plan because they're not. I'm not prepared to help them with that. But secondly, you just took your best running back off the field, and that's not good either. So right. there, there's some real negatives to that. That if we're going to pull them out, and here's the other thing: most managers that, that get promoted into a role, they take the pay raise and they take whatever, and it sounds good. They never will raise their hand and say, "I don't know how to do this," because you look like you're now. We've been taught that you're dumb if you if you don't know the answer to that. And the reality is there's nine other managers just like you thinking the same thing and they just won't raise their hand either, right? right. And so when, when uh, I think we owe our people the responsibility that if we're gonna put them in those leadership roles, we've gotta give them the tools to do that. So if you're in senior leadership, you, we have to give them the tools to develop those skills so that they can still, that they can be a great leader, but you gotta right. give them the tools to get there. And, and when it comes to coaching, you've gotta give them those tools and that understanding of what coaching actually means because otherwise they're going to put their face into the spreadsheet and do nothing but do one-on-ones with their people talking about numbers and then go back and think that they've been coaching. I, I tell you, one of my favorite coaches, and I'm a, listen, don't get me wrong. I'm a Tennessee guy and it really hurts me to say this, but I, uh, w- when I look at Nick Saban, he, he is one of my favorite from a leadership perspective because he gives clear expectations of what everyone's job and task is to do. They all know that's been, that's been already prepared and we all know. And if everybody on the team, knows what the expectations are, we tend to can rise to that occasion. But if there's, and he talks about a, a ton in all his, if, if you've ever seen him speak, he's talked yeah. a lot about this, but he talks about high achievers don't like mediocre performers and mediocre performers don't like high achievers. And if you try to have the two on your team, there's no chemistry. Well, yeah. at the end of the day, if we all know what the goal is, and then I know everybody on my team's why, then I can, we can all work towards that goal. And I know why they're doing what they're doing. Now, when we sit down to have one-on-ones, are the activities that they're doing in alignment with what their goal is. And that's where that's the crux of our conversations. And if they are, then we're, we're moving that direction. If they're not, then I can step back and say, okay, then we need to correct that. Right. Yeah. And it's their goal, not mine. Right. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Their goal, their goal can't be, it's gotta be theirs, not yours. This has been really good, Mike. I know this, we're recording this on a Friday. I didn't want to take too much of your time, but I thought you were the perfect person to start. The, the reboot of the mental selling podcast with. So um, we really appreciate you being here. 
I appreciate all you're doing, Will, to, to, to get this kicked off and started. And the new website looks great. I, I'm looking forward to uh, let's do this again. We'll do these again in the in the in the coming year. I'd love to, to sit down and, and maybe do a few more regular pieces with this because this we is will. Uh, I love talking about it. We will. So we're going to have Mike back uh, regularly on this podcast. And again, you can you can go back and listen to previous episodes we've done with Mike, episode 23 and episode 12. Uh, you can find all of our previous episodes on our website at integritysolutions.com. Just look under the resources section. And of course, you can find us anywhere that you get your podcasts. Um, subscribe, give us a review. Um, you can even go and follow Integrity Solutions on LinkedIn or Twitter, well, where we share not only podcast episodes, but a lot more insightful content, including other stuff that Mike has, has written for us. Um, we'll see you again in January. We've already have um, two great future guests lined up with more to come after that. You're again, you're going to be seeing much more frequent episodes uh, from us. And until then, please enjoy this final stretch to the year end. Hopefully you get some downtime then with family and friends over the holidays. We're so help, help you gear up for a great 2022. And uh, we will look forward to being there along alongside you next year and, and helping you get where you want to be. Mike, thanks for joining. And Good thank you, you everybody for listening and, and have a great day. See you again. Thanks. You've been listening to Mental Selling, an Integrity Solutions podcast. Stay in touch with us by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast player and following us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Please give us a rating, leave a comment, and share episodes you love. That helps us keep empowering sales and service leaders to master the mental side of selling. Until next time, let's go out and create amazing customer experiences.